All right, so Sacred Families, Developing the Family According to God's Design, this uh, title of this particular lesson, The Family Mobile, Seven Ways to Look at the Christian Home. This is part two of that particular lesson. I want to mention that this is the last complete lesson in our series, uh, our Sacred Family series. Uh, there'll be an additional lesson, a bonus lesson, which is a kind of a workshop type of small group discussion um, um, information that I'll provide, but that'll be strictly online. That'll be another class, but it'll be online for those who are following this um, through the video and through the BibleTalk.tv uh, website. But for our live class here, this is the last class of this series. Next Sunday we start a new quarter. So before we finish up uh, with the conclusion to the lesson on the family as a mobile unit, I'd like to review some of the key ideas from our past sessions, kind of you know, wrap it up a little bit. Key ideas, key idea number one, we are called by God to be sacred families. That's a calling. You know, people say, what's my calling in life? Should I be a doctor or should I be a, a, an attorney or a nurse or a whatever? You know? Well, being a sacred family is a calling from God. The foundational idea in the series is that God calls on us to be sacred or set apart or holy as families, not just a happy family or a successful family or a wealthy family, but also a sacred family. And God in His word provides the information on how to achieve this status in our marriages, our parenting experience, and the homes that result from the decisions that we make about marriage and family, so on and so forth. So I said that striving to be a sacred family is important for several reasons. First, the sacred family is a type or a preview of what our heavenly existence will be like. God has given us family to introduce us to heavenly living. Secondly, it is a witness of our faith in the everyday world. Your family says a lot about your faith. You don't always have time or opportunity at work, for example, to sit down with a fellow worker and say, well, let me tell you about my religion or let me tell you about my faith or let me show you something about the Bible. You may not either have time or it may not even be appropriate to take that kind of time at work and you know, use it up to kind of share your faith or teach somebody the Bible. It doesn't always work that way. But people always see your family life. That's always on display in front of other, in front of other people. And so a sacred family uh, makes a tremendous witness for your faith. And number three, it's, uh, it's an important tool that God uses to build His kingdom here on earth. The church is built primarily through the service of sacred families. Through the service of sacred families. Second uh, big idea that we talked about, sacred family begins with a biblical marriage. Biblical marriages have a certain DNA or structure that includes the following things. First of all, the knowledge of self. You got to know your, before you get married, you need to know you. I know I, this is 2020, hindsight. Everybody that you know, has taken this class eventually says to me, well, I wish I knew this before I got married. I wish I knew this when I was 20, but you know, be that way <laughs> as it is. At least we're getting the information. Now we can pass it on to our children or grandchildren, whatever. But knowledge of self is important. You got to know yourself before you begin thinking about marrying someone or committing your life to being with someone else. You also have to know the partner. Knowing the other person is the way that you cultivate love in your relationship. We said you need a commitment to marriage. There are a lot of different arrangements going on in our world, we know this. People live without being legally married. You know, people just go from one partner to the other. Others divorce and remarry and divorce and remarry and divorce. You know, we see that in our, we even have you know, group marriages, all kinds of formats that people say, well, this is our lifestyle. This is the way we want to express our, quote, family. But in the Bible, God is very specific about what he says, what a marriage is. A marriage is a commitment for life to one individual 
blessed or ordained by a legal contract. So a biblical marriage is one that has a commitment to unity confirmed with society's blessing. And usually that blessing of society is what we call marriage. And also sexual intimacy for one man and one woman. Maturity, love, unity, and then the oneness. We find oneness through sexual intimacy, through faithful sexual intimacy. Now these are the basic elements and the order for a biblical marriage. Now the goal for a biblical marriage is not to pay off the mortgage. The goal for a biblical marriage is, is not to uh, have enough money to put all the kids through college. I mean, that's good. We have to have those kinds of goals. But the goal for a biblical marriage is to love our partner for a lifetime. That's the goal. You know, what am I doing in my marriage? What am I shooting for to have a successful marriage? Well, what I'm shooting for is to love my partner for life. I'm, I'm working at cultivating love for life. This is the goal of a biblical marriage. And we talked about a lot of things concerning marriage, but the main thing to practice in order to keep love alive in a marriage was open, honest, and complete communication. You cannot nurture love without good communication. We said the communication between the couple, this is the currency of love. This is the current, yeah, you know, people come to me for counseling, they're having trouble in their marriage for whatever reasons. And when we examine, you know, when, I, when we dig down a little further into that relationship, usually the problem is they're not talking to each other or if they're talking, they're not communicating, they're not saying anything, they're not really, you know, the communication is, so how was your day? Oh, well, you know, I went here, I went there, I did this, I did that. How was your day? Well, you know, it was a rough day at the office, you know, so and so, we haven't hired a new guy yet, whatever. You know that. And this, you, know, you can do that once or twice. You keep up that level of conversation for six months, you're going to start you know, drifting away from each other. You have to really talk to each other. Yeah, that happened at the office, okay. And then maybe the follow-up question was, so how did that make you feel? <laughs> you don't have to psychoanalyze your partner, but so how do you feel about that? Are you, you, know, are you being depressed by that? You know, is there something I can do to kind of... You have to really communicate. You have to really say, this is how I really feel. You know that thing that happened, we were over at so-and-so's house and then you said this and that. I'm sorry, but that, I really felt offended when you said that. What? Well, yeah, well, why would you be offended? Blah, blah, blah. Talk, 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 work it out. Okay, well, in the future, maybe I'm, you know, okay, I'll be careful on that point. You know, real communication, real communication. And so we're called by God to establish sacred families and the foundation for these are a biblical marriage where the partners are committed to loving one another for life. That's a biblical marriage. All right, another big idea. Again, this is just review here. Children are for God's glory, not for our glory in a sacred marriage. There's great joy and pride in having our own children, but as Christians our purpose is to honor God in the way we raise our children and the kind of life we breathe into our children. You see, just as God breathed life into us, not only to make us humanly alive, but spiritually alive as well, we as parents, we also breathe a life into our children and we need to be sure that the life we give them will eventually lead them to God. You know, in a sacred family, the parents know that the spiritualization of their children is their primary responsibility at every stage of their development. For example, in early childhood, in that early childhood period, it consists of helping children learn about a healthy submission to their parents' authority. If you can't teach your children, or if we, because I'm in the boat too, if we can't teach our children you know, from zero to three or four years old that obeying mommy and obeying daddy is their number one job, then we're going to have a lot of fun with them when they're 16 and 17. <laughs> Remember the, the, the 1,000 no day? 
Today I said no 1,000 times and I'm getting awfully sick of it. Well, yeah, but you'll see, it'll pay off. Because you're teaching your child, when daddy says this, you're going to stop and pay attention. Look at me, you're going to pay attention. Something is coming when I call your name and you know, eventually, you know, uh, Susie, nobody's got a Susie child here? Okay, good, Susie. You know, and Susie stops and goes, yes, daddy or mommy, yeah, what? Or looks at Susie. You know, and that's okay if Susie is about to take her little brother's toy. Susie, oh, what? That's, you know, if she doesn't pay attention right away and keeps on going. But if Susie is walking out into the middle of the street, chasing her ball, and she's about to step off the curve, and you say, Susie, and she, she does, like she doesn't pay attention. She could, you see, right there, it'd be a good thing that she would be paying attention to Susie right away the first time. And in life, Susie brings home some <laughs> strange thing, <laughs> some strange thing boyfriend. If she hasn't learned Susie, pay attention, maybe, maybe at 15, if she hasn't learned Susie, mommy's seriously talking to you and paying attention to you, you know? Very important. And then in the preteen stage, parents form their children by teaching them to take ownership for their decisions. Again, easy to say, not easy to do. Because when we, when we make them take ownership of their decisions, even their bad decisions, you know, at, at that preteen stage, it also many times puts a burden on us. We told you, if this wasn't done, there was no going over spending the weekend at grandma's or your friend's house. And that didn't get done. Sorry, too bad, so sad, we, we told you, you, you decided to ignore it, and so the consequence of your decision is your ground. But mom, this is the, it's the big weekend. It's, we've been looking forward to this. <laughs> Sorry, you decided that. But the thing that Susie does, poor Susie, the thing that Susie doesn't understand is while she was going to be gone to her friend, you and your partner, wife, husband, were going to go out of town to, you know, a little getaway. So a lot of times teaching those lessons also costs you something. And then during the teen and young adult years, parents need to transform themselves from authority figures to mentors in order to maintain a good relationship and a good communication with their children. By the time kids are 16, 17, 18, I mean, you know, they're fully functional. Helping our children grow up in the sacred family requires that we equip them for every stage of their development so they can be men and women of faith who live in an unbelieving world. You know, why? It's a lot of work bringing these kids to Sunday school and to VBS and to camp and to the, you know, the area-wide things for the team. It's a lot of work doing that kind of thing, but it pays off because when they leave home, they're going into a world that doesn't believe. They're going into a world that will fight them on their faith at every step. So you need to equip them you know, well, not only with understanding of the scriptures, you need to equip them with friendships, with other believing you know, young people, so that they have at least some sort of network, some sort of friendship, some sort of system that helps them navigate those difficult years um, of, uh, of adolescence. All right, fourth big idea, real quick. Parents learn from children. Be ready to learn things that your children teach you. So parenting within the sacred family affords the parents opportunities to learn from their children as well as teach their children. We as parents sometimes, you know, we miss important lessons that God is trying to teach us through our children. As a parent, I have learned much about patience, service, forgiveness, and self-control through my children if I'm willing to learn. That's the problem. A lot of times the lesson is there, but you know, my attitude is wrong. So I quote again from Gary Thomas, you know, the book entitled Sacred Parenting. He says the following, 
just as God's response to His children reveal His character, so parenting reveals our character. And so this brings us to the last week's lesson, you know, entitled Seven Ways to Look at the Christian Home. In this lesson, we used Edith Schaefer's book entitled What is Family? to create a view of the sacred family from an artistic perspective. Remember we said we'd kind of build a mobile? She described families as living mobiles whose wonderful pieces of art that are pieced together using different materials. So based on that artwork created by the artist, we talked about him last week or a couple of weeks ago, Alexander Caldwell, not Campbell, Caldwell. So just, here's I think a there. So just as these mobile, this is a mobile here, this is the, the, the artistic uh, example of a mobile, just as these mobiles were made using different shapes and sizes. They were all balanced you know, to form an artistic whole. Uh, Ms. Schaefer said, families are kind of like this. They're connected, yet they're different. They're counterbalanced, so to remove one element would upset the, you know, in, in this mobile, if you were to cut, this, cut the string and let this piece go here, the, the piece on the far right, then the mobile would just, you know, it would be out of balance. Well, in the same way, a, fam a family, different people, different parts, different attitudes, different characters. How many parents have said, we have five children. They were all raised in the exact same house by the exact two people, and yet I cannot find five more different people. How does that happen? Yeah, how does that happen? And then, of course, an endless variety, like mobiles, you can make an endless variety of mobiles, but it's always recognizable as a mobile in the same way. You have a whole variety of people and cultures, but it's always recognizable as family. So in our last session, I began putting together a family mobile and I suggested some of the elements that were needed to make a family mobile. For example, in a sacred family mobile, you need to have first and foremost a balanced environment consisting of that biblical marriage you know, founded in Christ. You also need a sense of home, where the home is essentially where the family chooses to share their lives together, not a place to get away from as soon as possible. You know, when kids are saying, I can't wait to get out of this place. The minute they're legally able to, they're gone. You know, something tells you maybe that that place where they were living at was not much of a home. Thirdly, a place for creativity where individuals are encouraged, encouraged to think and to express themselves. Even expressing dangerous, crazy ideas, immature ideas, yeah, okay. at home you're allowed to you know, say crazy things. Now you get called on it, And then I said, a training ground for relationships because family is where we learn how to treat people in Christian love. You know, we said about uh, training ground for relationships, the home, the family, usually the first place where we learn to say thank you or I'm sorry or I apologize or I was wrong or yes, I do forgive. You know, it's where we learn how to do those things. So now we're going to continue this lesson on the family mobile describing the final three elements that we need to have in order to complete our model. So a fifth element in the family mobile, a center for truth, a center for truth. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Quebec government, Quebec in Canada, where Lise and I uh, come from, Quebec government implemented a religion and ethics course in elementary and high school that basically teaches that every religion is the same. Even private schools had to teach this program. <laughs> of course, if a child is taught that every religion is the same, then no one religion is better than the other. Now the government has imposed the doctrine of universalism or pluralism on the schools. You know, all roads lead to heaven. Of course, this flies in the face of Christianity's teaching that says there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. 
We don't have to apologize for the fact that the Bible, Christianity, is an exclusive religion. You don't have to agree with that. You can deny that, but you can't deny that that's what the Bible teaches about Christianity. It teaches that it's an exclusive religion. There's only one way to be saved through Christ. Only one mediator, Jesus Christ. Only one God. Which God? The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God who sent Jesus. That God. Not the God of the Hindus. Not Molech. Not, you know, only one God who appeared in human form through the man Jesus Christ. That, that's what the Bible teaches. That's what Christianity teaches. So there was a time when schools and the community at large could be counted on to support and confirm the moral values and broad teachings of the Christian home. But this isn't true anymore. You know, the responsibility for teaching about God and Christian morality the salvation through Christ has always been the responsibility of the home with the help of the church. Second Timothy 3.15, right? I'm going to quote this later on <clears throat> during the announcements, but Second Timothy 3.15, Paul says, uh, you, uh, from an early age, he's talking to Timothy, he says, from an early age you have known the holy writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation. What is he saying here? Is he saying, well, when you became an adolescent and went to high school, they taught you about, no. He says, from an early age, when you were a child, said, you have known the holy writings. But well, who was teaching him at an early age? Well, his mother was teaching him, we know. And his grandmother was teaching him, because his father was a pagan. But his parents were teaching him the holy writings. And what did that do? That made him wise. And what did that wisdom lead him to? Well, that wisdom led him to Christ and salvation. Later on he was trained by Paul to preach and to be active in the church, but the basic responsibility belonged to the parents. Today we're in danger of losing the present generation because they receive little or no support for their faith in society or at school. You know, the home and family therefore have to uh, go, uh, have, to, have to be the place where ideas are tested against the light of God's word. It has to be the center for truth where godless philosophies and false religions can be exposed and talk about, talked about and debated. Because kids are going to bring home all kinds of stuff, right? They bring home friends, some you love, you know, oh I love when Johnny plays with you know, whoever. But they're going to bring home some friends that you go, Phew. my mother used to get on my nerves because of that. She had a nose for people, you know. I mean, the guy would just show up at the door and ask, hey, is Mike there? We're going, yeah, okay, Mom, going with Johnny, you know. And I'd come home after, I don't like him. Well, you just, he, he said three words, I don't like him. He's not, you know, I don't like you hanging around with him. But well, you don't know him, never mind, I know, I know who he is. <laughs> she was right, every time she was right. The home has to be that, that place. It, 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 it must be especially the place where one can see the truth being spoken and acted out by parents and children and extended family. You know, we don't walk the walk while we're in church. Kids, you know, they see how we are in church and they see how we are at home. They see it. And our faith is really, it becomes um, hmm, viable to them real to them if they see us walk in the walk at home as well as in church or during church activities. So home and family are synonymous with prayer time and Bible. You know, if, if your child never sees you pick up your Bible, never, except on Sunday morning where it's laid on the, 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 you know, the bureau, the little desk you know, near the front door, if the only time they see you touch that Bible is on your way out to church, and then when you come home you lay it down with your keys and it just stays there for the rest of the week, how are they ever going to want to become readers of the Bible? They don't see you doing it. You know, when someone goes home, they need to know that the people there will speak truth in love to them. And the truth will be this. Again, our own children, when, when we'd have a debate about the propriety of something or you know, whatever, whatever it was. You know, it's easy to say, uh, 
you shouldn't take you know, illegal drugs, because I mean, it's, they're illegal. <laughs> you don't even have to open the Bible, they're illegal. But you know, there's some stuff that's in the gray area and we debate and, and I'd say, listen, the Bible says that we should flee from every appearance of evil. I quote that. And always the response was, oh, dad, don't, you're not, that's not fair. You're using the Bible. <laughs> it's like, no, don't use the Bible. We, can't. we don't have a response to that. We, we can argue with you with your own reasoning, dad. You know, when, when you're trying to kind of get your way with us, using your own arguments. But the minute you start quoting scripture, okay, now you've crossed the pale. You know, you've gone beyond the pale. Now it's not fair. You're using the word. Well, that's okay to use the word to settle debates and, and arguments and to find the truth. You know, that's fine. So home is where the truth is spoken and acted out. Uh, another you know, piece in the family mobile. The home is a museum for memories. A Christian home serves as a museum exhibiting shared memories as a family. You know, before a couple of lessons ago, I spoke of the pictures that were on the wall, each capturing a special moment in our children's lives. A home is a, a museum in the sense that it houses treasured memories in pictures, souvenirs, artwork, trophies, awards, each containing the essence of a special time or a special place. I have one of these. My Montreal Canadiens box, for those of you who know little about hockey. Montreal Canadiens, of course, legendary hockey team, home in Montreal, Canada, where we come from. But there was a particular year, you know, 2008, a particular year where everybody in the family got into hockey. For some reason or other, we got, we got hockey crazy that year because the Canadians were in it, you know, and they were in it, they got into the finals, and you know, we were just, and so we went to a game uh, with uh, Hal and Emily and, and Lise and myself and we went to a game and it just without going too long, uh, that particular game, the Canadians made the greatest comeback in their 100 year history as a, as a professional hockey team. Uh, they were down five nothing in the first period and they came back from a deficit of five goals to win six to five in overtime. And we were there watching it and seriously, no voice left. We were talking like this at the end of the game. Because we, had no voice. we had screamed and shouted. So. But the whole year was like that. Tuesday night hockey, Saturday night, everybody come over sometimes and we'd make food and we'd cheer on the team. It was just a fun thing. And so we made this little box here with the tickets from our game and a picture of the scoring goal. And we even bought a, a, a memorial brick that, go, that went into the Montreal Canadiens you know, where, where they play. You know, they had a plaza there, you could buy a brick. We even bought a brick, which two years later they tore up to put in a parking lot. But anyways, that's a... <laughs> You know, that's pro sports for you, that's what happens. But this thing is a, is a memory. It, it, it encapsulates the whole year, all the fun that we had together. And it triggers a flood of good memories that took place over that period. Not just the games, but the good family times that we had during those games. One of the favorite pastimes for our children when they're all together is to go through the old photo albums and review the pictures. Now they've seen these many, many times, but our home is the place where these are kept, and it's almost like a special ritual to bundle up on the couch and go over the family albums and reminisce over the childhood and teen years before they were all married and moved away. You know, it's one of the disadvantages of digital photography where you store everything on a computer. It's not this, it doesn't have the same feel you know, as sitting on the couch you know, with the big book and turning the, turning the pages. Maybe I'm just being old fashioned, but there's something special about that. The point I want to make about the home as a museum of memories is that just like a regular museum, the house as museum needs a curator. In other words, those pictures are there because somebody remembered to bring the camera and to record the special event for those fun moments. In our family, it was Lee's who painstakingly categorized the pictures and created the albums. You know, while the children slept after a wonderful weekend and, you know, and we got the pictures back from Walmart or in those days back from the pharmacy, you'd go to the pharmacy and bring your pictures and have them developed. And she would be the one late at night while everybody slept, gone to bed, dreaming about the wonderful time. She was the one you know, with the pencil and selecting the right one and you know, 
scotch taping them into the album on the back of each picture, writing the date and where we were, you know, one picture at a time, lovingly doing that you know, for, I mean, you know, for years and years. Somebody had to do that. So special memories, they have to be preserved. And this requires forethought and, and some work, but the rewards are quite wonderful. And special memories and traditions can be and should be created and recreated. Family dinners and reunions at special times done when you were young should be reestablished in your own family. That's okay. That's how we hang on to the good things of the past. Many families have all kinds of wonderful experiences and activities, but unless they're documented or memorialized somehow, they fade from view and their joy is fleeting. So the home as a museum for memories allows the family to have a sense of continuity and history about itself from generation to generation. I love doing, I have a breadboard that I made when I was in seventh grade. I kept that, a breadboard, you know, a cutting board. And I mean, it is the worst looking, you, you know, you'd think, <laughs> the guy who made this breadboard, I mean, you see all the chips and you know, the planing was not smooth, you know, it's, not, it's not completely oval, you know what I'm saying? It's terrible. It's terrible. I was like 12 or 13 when I made it, you know, but no, it demonstrated, okay, this guy had no skill whatsoever. But I kept that breadboard. And then when William was in school, he made a breadboard. Well, his breadboard, I mean, it's perfect. You know, I mean, it, it's perfect. You know, and it has got, I can't describe it, but it's got different color wood that is you know, pressed in, glued in, and perfect. You could have bought it at a store. It's perfect. And then next to that one, I put Paul, not breadboard, bread box with a sliding door and the whole thing you know, made by hand. I was saying, here's the, this is, this is my, tongue in cheek, this is my argument for evolution of man. You know? <laughs> my generation and then the generations you know, uh, evolving forward. Who knows what the grandkids are going are to make? Who knows? Uh, in our home, every piece of art and, and decoration and knickknack actually has meaning and memory for, of some kind. It's not just a decoration. Every, every picture is a picture of something from somewhere that we did together or as a family. In this way, our home embodies the history and the spirit of our family wherever we live. And you could come to our home and say, well, what, what's that? And we can tell you where that comes from and what that is and what that's about. None of it is just decoration bought for its own sake. Finally, home should always be, most important, a shelter from the storm. A shelter from the storm. When I read the, prodig the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, I am always struck by the attitude of the father in the story. The younger son does go away with his share of the inheritance. He's selfish, he's self-centered. He does waste it on immoral living. He does bring shame on himself and his family, and when he returns, he comes back with nothing left except an apology. We know the story. But what does the father do? Does he accept him back with conditions? Okay, you're back, but here, okay, now, you know, you're going to be towing the line from, you're going to live in the servant's quarters, you've got to give me 10 hours a day, you only get one day off, blah, 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 blah. Is that what he does? Does he review all of his mistakes? Okay, let's, let's take a look at what you've done here. You know, first of all, you ask, before your older brother, you ask for your inheritance, which was wrong. And then, you, is that what he does? Or does he tell him, I told you, I knew it. Oh, here you are, I knew you'd come. Yeah, is that what happens? No, he hugs him and he says what? Let's go home, son. That's what he says. Oh, I'm sure the son had bad memories and there were some consequences because of his bad choices. But on that night, what was needed was the safety and the assurance and the acceptance of home. Above all else, home needs to be a sure refuge, a place where you can go to find comfort and forgiveness and encouragement from the raging storms of failure, rejection, and the other trials of life. The prodigal son did not think of going to his uncle's house when he was down and out. He wanted to go home. Our home 
should be a preview of what heaven is like because the Bible refers to it as our ultimate home, right? 2 Corinthians 5.8, Paul says, at home with the Lord. In it we can retreat to a place where Jesus is the Lord and those who enter there are received as He has received us, with mercy and kindness and love and acceptance. You know, they say you can never go home, but for the sacred family, home is where you're always welcome. Edith Schaefer, wife of Christian philosopher Francis Schaefer, said in her book, What is Family?, which I have used extensively for this particular session, she says the following, family is a mobile blown by the gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit. And in the mobile that God directs and animates are the various and beautiful pieces that we described as a balanced environment, a sense of home, a place for creativity, a training ground for relationships, a center for truth, a museum for memories, and a shelter from the storm. So I pray that your sacred families can be all of these things and more as Christ continues to dwell in your hearts and more importantly at this point in your, in your homes. Okay. That's the end of our series. Like I say, there'll be one more bonus class, but it'll strictly be online for those who are following on the website. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it.